this um, welcome back to this uh, session. Now we have the pleasure to listen to Constantin Kani from University of Toronto, who will speak about stationary solution to the stochastic heat equation. Well, thank you very much uh, for inviting me and for introduction. Uh, I'm sorry for the delay, and uh, I was just uh, suspicious of trying to update things as usual, but it was a wrong idea. Uh, so uh, I'll speak about actually kind of a class of equations, not just stochastic heat equation, uh, but uh, the class of equation which include Burgess equation and hamilton jacobi equation. And uh, let me just uh, move forward. So basically one of the main uh, characters will be a random force hamilton jacobi equation, which is written here on the screen. It's equation for the scalar function phi. Uh, phi is a function of X and T. X will be assumed to be in RD and uh, T is one dimensional, of course. And I consider for the purpose of kind of introduction, the most general case, when this is a Hamiltonian, it's a just convex function, not necessarily a quadratic function, but mostly we'll consider quadratic Hamiltonian function of the gradient of phi. And gradient and Laplacian are always understood in a, for the space variable x. And then there's viscosity nu uh, times Laplacian. Uh, so these terms give uh, is important because uh, I will see it. Uh, for the heat equation uh, part. And then there is a, a potential F omega. Omega stands for randomness. It's just indication that uh, potential is random, but we always fix this realization of random potential. So we're in a quench situation. So this is just particular realization of potential, which is importantly depend on space and time variable. And of course, there is kind of decay of correlation, but, but we'll see it later on. I mean, it will be conditions will be formulated. So that's the equation that which I want to look at, but most results will be corresponding to the case when this is a gradient phi square, but uh, conjecturally uh, results are uh, holds in the general case as well. Uh, so of course this term gives us dissipation, and uh, but one can consider in this case when nu is equal to zero, so nu is equal to zero in the visit case, uh, and this corresponds to more dynamical systems like uh, random Lagrangian systems uh, and formation of shocks, but it's important case because it appears in many physical situations. And uh, then nu greater than zero, the solutions of this equation will be smooth in X. That's because I consider potential being not white in X, but smooth in X. And uh, that's why solution will be smooth in X as well. Uh, so uh, basically this equation has a first integral, which is a gradient of phi. It's the first integral uh, uh, of this equation, actually kind of uh, average value of the gradient of phi. So in terms of Burgess equation can be thought as a uh, average velocity of the, for the equation. In terms of hamilton curve equation, it means that we can consider this function phi, which has the form linear function with some vector b, fixed vector b in rd. So a linear function uh, plus function of sublinear growth, psi xt. And psi is a function, sublinear growth means that uh, limit is equal to zero when x increases, so it grows. It can grow at some power of x uh, smaller than one. And uh, so here is the main conjecture. But of course, it's a conjecture, so not uh, so the partially partial results are available, and we'll discuss some of them. Uh, but also discuss what are the approaches for this conjecture. So the main conjecture is, is that for uh, for an arbitrary b, if it's fixed b, and then we fix typical configuration of the uh, random potential, then uh, almost surely there exists a unique, up to a negative constant, global solution to the hamilton jacobi equation. So global solution uh, here, B is fixed, omega is fixed. So this global solution would have form B times X, this is linear form, plus this unique up to a negative constant function Psi. And global means that it's a solution which is valid for all times from minus infinity to plus infinity. And uh, so this is what is called sometimes one force one solution principle that, uh, uh, after, meaning that if we uh, solve equation, say Cauchy problem of this equation, starting from two initial data for a long time, then solution get closer and closer. 
and they're approaching this uh, kind of uh, unique solution. Uh, so let me comment on what I'm saying. So at the moment, there are few res rigorous results in this direction. And all of them, as far as I know, correspond to the case when Hamiltonian is quadratic. Uh, uh, there are several reasons why quadratic Hamiltonians are special. Uh, although, as I say, conjecturally, it should be true always, but technique does not allow to do this yet. Uh, so um, uh, quadratic case is a Hamiltonian P square over two and P is here is a momentum. And this corresponds to the case of Burgess equation, uh, meaning that if we consider instead of phi, the gradient of phi velocity field for quadratic Hamiltonian momentum and velocity will be the same. So velocity field U, which is a gradient of phi, then there is a Burgess equation, random force Burgess equation, uh, which is equivalent to the hamilton jacob equation. But that's well known. So the, the three cases which are known are basically one dimensional case. Uh, and uh, there are reasonable results obtained there, not full generality, but reasonable results. Uh, when nu is zero, that was a uh, long time ago, paper with Yuri Bakhtin and Eric Kator, where we can see the inviscid case and proof existence for other irregular uh, uh, forcings with proof existence uh, of this unique global solutions and other things. And for new positive, it was done by Yuri and his, uh, at that time, graduate student, uh, Ling Ili, who is now a doctoral fellow in Toronto. And the other case, which is rather well understood, and I would speak about new result in this case later on. This is a case of high dimensional case, G greater equal to three, and forcing is small. Uh, so, uh, for those who know, this corresponds to what is called a weak disorder regime, and the results there uh, are known from 90s and even 80s of uh, 2080s and uh, uh, 90s, uh, and they started a statistical mechanical problem about directed polymer by Spencer and Imbri and Boldhaus and Sinai, and then Kiefer proved result about uh, unique global solution for the context of random force Burgers equation. And uh, what I will discuss in more details will be improvement of the results of this direction. Now, uh, as I said, why uh, Hamiltonian P square is uh, special, why quadratic case is special, is because of several reasons. And one of them is the fact that uh, uh, Kohlhoff transformation, which is written here, so when phi can be written as a minus two new U is viscosity, times logarithm of the uh, of the partition function z, z is, will be positive. After this change of variable, the equation will be linear, linearized, and we get stochastic heat equation, which is written here. Uh, so stochastic heat equation is equivalent to the uh, random hamilton jacobi equation in case of positive viscosity. For zero viscosity, uh, we cannot, uh, there is no, Call hope transformation. And uh, sorry for misprinting Feynman here. And uh, then we have Feynman Katz formula, of course, for stochastic heat equation, which uh, somehow can be viewed as a, uh, it doesn't help so much in studying this equation sometimes, but uh, especially in the limit when u goes to zero, but it's important formula and which allow you to view solution in a certain way. So that is a formula to express solution to the stochastic heat equation. Uh, uh, if initial data is given, initial data, phi zero here is initial data for the hamilton jacob equation. So exponential one over two new of it will be initial data uh, with minus sign for the uh, heat equation, positive one. And so what you do here is you integrate over the Brownian, standard Brownian motion. Now this Brownian motion uh, is a standard Brownian motion, which adds, so we want to find solution point X at time T. And so maybe I, it's better to look at this picture here. So we want to find solution at this point uh, X at time T. And so we put br bunch of Brownian motions going down in time. And for each uh, 
Brownian motion, we calculate the action of this Brownian motion. And uh, uh, this action, and I'm coming back. So it's, you integrate, the action will be given by integration of the forcing potential along this path. So this is expressed in terms of the uh, going down in time. That's why this formula look this way. Uh, and B is a standard Brownian motion. That's why you have square root of two nu here. That is a number, don't worry about it. And so this action also include the knowledge of the initial condition. So that's the total action. And then take exponential of it. And then you take average with respect of Brownian motion. This average would exactly give you the uh, partition function, the solution of the equation. And that's well-known uh, feynman cut formula. Uh, so that not here, I did not, the solution which corresponds to, uh, so this was initial, as I said, this initial condition of the stochastic heat equation, and this has this form, and that's why formula look the way it looked here. Uh, we have this phi naught term here. Okay, so another important object which I will discuss will be polymer measure. So polymer measure, is a, a probability distribution of the paths which are finishing at point. So it has two endpoints. One endpoint it fixes, it's at point at point X at time T, and then there is another endpoint which varies at time zero. And uh, the polymer measure is just a, a Gibson formula uh, over the, so the probability distribution of this path will not be any more Brownian, but it will be given by the Gibbs formula. So every path will have uh, probability distribution given by this expression. So it's one of a partition function just to make the probability distribution. And that's uh, probability is proportional to exponential of the action. Now this term doesn't have, uh, doesn't include initial condition. It doesn't know about the initial condition. It only knows about potential everywhere. You integrate potential over the curve and that gives you the statistical weight of the path uh, using this Gibbs formula. And uh, polymer measures are a very convenient way to describe solutions because you can write down solution uh, of the equation with the given initial data by just taking initial data and integrating it with respect of the polymer measure. And that's not quite a solution, but it's a solution up to the uh, uh, factor, which is partition function corresponding to that point, so up to this after multiplying on this partition function, you get uh, exact solution to the equation. So if you know, uh, have information about, uh, about this uh, polymer measure, if you know very well, what is the distribution of the endpoint of polymer measure, because here is the endpoint of the pass gamma, uh, you take it at, at time zero, and, uh, and uh, so just only, endpoint distribution appearing in this formula. If you have good control of the endpoint distribution of the polymer measure, then you know a lot of information about solution of stochastic heat equation. So the paper, uh, which is uh, which actually already one year old, but it's still um, we're finishing some kind of uh, little pieces there. Uh, so this paper is by uh, Tobias Hurst, Beatrice Navarra, and myself. And it corresponds to a situation where uh, we, it can be done in more general case, but we wanted to focus on the uh, mostly on the clean uh, way to, uh, to look at it. So we're in discrete setting. So X is discrete, time is continuous. And the random force is giving by random forcing potential is giving by collection of independent standard Wiener processes. So at every point, uh, at, at every point uh, uh, of the lattice X, you have standard Wiener process. And actually you can think about it white noise of derivative of this Wiener process. So you have white noises independent, uh, white noises at the time at every point X of the uh, lattice ZD. And then you can see the, uh, the heat equation on this, this discrete setting. So it makes perfect sense to consider heat equation in discrete setting, Laplace will be discrete Laplacian. And then there is a discrete Feynman-Katz formula 
which is uh, which I will describe below, which give exact solution in this situation. Uh, so just discrete structure come goes through Feynman Cast formula. So here is how it works. Uh, so uh, again, we have this uh, Brodian pass, so which can go to gamma s. So s is between zero and t. So it's a pass going down in time, and then. Uh, uh, this passes has the following structure. There is exponential clock, and when this clock rings, the pass jumps to near near uh, nearest neighboring point. So uh, this pass gamma is at, at the origin at time zero, and when alarm goes off, the pass jumps uh, to the neighboring point and then keep uh, jumping in all this uh, time indicated by this Poissonian field of of the over the alarm clocks. And so if configure if gamma is giving this gamma pass which jumps back and forth uh, through the points in particular times, then what will be the action? The action is the integral along this uh, potential F, but F is uh, white noises in particular points. So basically you are staying at every point, certain amount of time. This amount of time you are staying at point between T minus SI to T minus SI plus one. And you're staying in particular point, And this is point X plus gamma I. And then when you integrate over this time, you just get difference of the of the winner processes between this point and that point. That's exactly part of action between these moments of time between SI and SI plus one, and then you have to take sum over all I's. So that's the exact expression that give you the action of the pass. And then the formula for solution is given by uh, taking expectation of the probability distribution of this pass gamma, and I describe its statistics precisely. And then you take uh, initial condition and multiply it by exponential of, the, of this particular action. Uh, in this formula, uh, I took particular value of nu. Nu will not play important role. So two nu is equal to one. So the formula looked this way. We don't have factor one over two nu. All right. So that's uh, how solution can be written. And then uh, what is a weak force? So weak force is the following thing. You just introduce coupling constant, uh, beta. It's inverse temperature. If you think about Gibson formula. So that your potential actually is not white noise, uh, uh, sorry, white noise or winner process uh, WI, but it's multiplied by beta. And so that uh, when beta is large, it's large potential. When beta is small, it's small potential. So beta is a sense of inverse temperature in a sense, and oh, say coupling constant. And uh, we would consider small beta because we will want to be in the regime of uh, of weak disorder, so small beta and high uh, dimension dimension greater or equal than three. I remind you that phi uh, solution to, should be, supposed to be a form B times X plus function of sublinear growth. In terms of the Hamilton of the heat equation, this is Hamilton Jacobi equation. Heat equation, it is e to the minus b times x e to the minus function of sublinear growth. So what's essential that this function can grow very fast. Uh, that creates a lot of difficulty. That can grow very fast in x. So anything like e to the uh, to the uh, x absolute value of x and power less than one. Is allowed here, so function can have very take very large values at far away point x. So it's not bounded at all. And the theorem says the following: that let d be uh, greater or equal to three, then there exists uh, beta naught depending on dimension, such that for beta less than beta naught, almost surely there exists a unique up to multiplicative constant global solution to this equation z omega xt, this global solution. And uh, of course, uh, uh, when we go to heat equation, we're in multiplicative situation rather than additive. So this is, uh, you can multiply by any constant, it's still a solution. So solution is always up to a uh, multiplicative constant. And uh, then uh, what does it mean that there exists unique solution? It means the following, that if we consider the sequence of Cauchy problems on time interval starting in distinct paths, 
minus t n to, to the to zero time, it's always convenient to express global solution through the solution coming from past, from the distinct past. It's what, uh, it's what sometimes calls backward attractor in dynamical systems. So uh, if you consider this Cauchy problem here, where initial condition is giving in time minus t n, uh, uh, giving by some function such that logarithm of this function is of sublinear growth, then solutions at time zero will converge to this global solution. Again, up to a multiplicative constant. So that uh, this uh, equation has very strong uh, convergent property that starting from completely different initial conditions, we converge to the same unique, very special solution, which is determined by the uh, this configuration by the realization of the uh, forcing of the forcing potential. So here is the theorem, and the main difficulty here compared to the result of Kiefer is that we allow a very wide class of initial condition. And actually, this class is not because we want to be nasty, but because that's really something which is needed. You 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 have to consider sublinear growth because sublinear growth uh, is something which separates different Bs from each other. And B is the first integral of the system as we discussed already. So uh, that's I'm saying the same thing. Pre previous, results was, uh, were, previous results were proved for initial uh, conditions, uh, which are growing not faster than a linear function of, of X. And we're allowing something which is growing uh, almost, uh, this is allowed for us, uh, X in power one minus epsilon E in this power is allowed. And this requires completely different analysis because for the result of a type of Kiefer, you, it's enough to remain in a diffusive zone, this diffusive regime. And we have to go much farther than diffusive regime to prove our result. Uh, so uh, uh, in what I follow, I would just first describe in more detail uh, uh, why D is greater than three is needed and what is a big disorder and uh, why we need small values of potential. And uh, for simplicity, uh, I want to consider discrete time. So I would, in previous uh, slides, I was considering continuous time t. And the reason was that we wanted to have equations. So we don't, we don't know how to write uh, discrete time uh, heat equation in a proper way. Continuous time and discrete space heat equation is well understood. Uh, but it creates technical difficulties because the times of jumps are random and you have to deal with the statistics of these jumps. So it creates unnecessary but significant technical difficulties. And that's why papers are rather long. Uh, and it's much easier to describe results in the case when T is also discrete. And morally is the same thing. So we want to consider polymers and partition functions corresponding to discrete time. So, uh, uh, the, instead of white noise, well, I would have my forcing potential be given by realization of the IID Gaussian random variables, actually uh, zero, one random variables with uh, mean value uh, zero and variance one. And at every point of letter ZD, X space letter ZD, and every point of the time Z1, they're independent. There's an independent Gaussian field. This is simply a situation which is uh, counterpart to these white noises. Now, Gaussian property is important for what we are saying. It should not be important, but technically it's important. And I will explain where, where it is important. And so uh, the main object here is a partition function. So partition function, again, gamma n is a, uh, gamma n is a simpler object. It is a simple symmetric and of work. This is replacing this continuous time random work we discussed before. And for every pass gamma, the action is very simple. It's just some of the values of random variable psi along the pass. So you're jumping every integer time and you're going from, uh, 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 from one point to a neighboring point and so on. And some of these values uh, is uh, uh, the action of the pass and you multiply it by beta 
because we have primed the beta in front of xi, beta will be small. And then we take averaging with respect of all simple random walks, uh, symmetric uh, random walks of this one over 2D, power n is a probability of such thing. This is a factor which normalizes the thing, it's not random factor, which make it order one. And uh, we'll see it's order one. And in the same way, we can define actually partition function. So this is partition function, which kind of starts correspond to initial point zero zero. So uh, we uh, this passes start at the origin and, and time zero, and the passes has length n, and that's we have n here. It's random, so I could have put omega, but I'm not putting it. Otherwise, notation would be too heavy. And but I can also define the same thing, which going in the past. So I can consider random walks which going in the negative time from point zero zero in negative time going down. It's the same object, uh, but just going in negative. So this, the, the previous one partition function was a future partition function. We're going in the future and here is a past. So the end point is zero, zero, point zero times zero. And then we're going in the past and time. The same object so it has the same distribution. And then more generally, you can define starting from any point X at time S, and going to any point y at time t, t is greater than s, similar partition function. Um, and here should be t minus s. It's a, it's a time uh, of this random walk of this partition function. So this is object which I want to define. And what one can uh, prove easily, and I would explain at the moment that this partition function uh, converges to a limit uh, in L2 sense, they converges to a limit when n goes to infinity. So there is a limiting, it's a random variable, which is infinitely long partition function. That's why we normalize it to this factor e to the minus beta square uh, over uh, times n over two, that allow us to have a limit. And this limit uh, is just at every point uh, of letter z d plus one, there is a random variable, which is future limiting partition function and past limiting partition function. So the limit here and here, and this limit exists in L2. And this, in order to have this limit, one have to have small, beta small enough, and want to have a dimension greater or equal than three. That's where this condition comes. And that's uh, essence of uh, what is called weak disorder, because the fact that partition function have this limit and some other thing you should explain in a moment, tells us that uh, the behavior of the pass, this Gibson measure on a, on a simple random walks, uh, when it in, enhance simple random walks with this Gibson factor here, uh, the probability distribution will be diffusive. So the pass will be, will have diffusive, then point of the pass will have after normalization on square root of n Gaussian distribution and some other properties. So let me explain it very briefly. This is very simple calculation and uh, very neat calculation. So uh, instead of considering e to the beta xi, you, sub, you, you consider random variable eta, which will have mean value zero and the variance will be given by this expression. So we just subtract uh, average value of this thing and normalize it uh, on e to the beta square over two. And uh, so if we do this, then it's more convenient to write partition function in the following form. It is instead of th this term, we have one plus eta here and e to the beta square over two time n it's incorporated through the division. So that's expression for partition function. And as always very often in statistical mechanics, you have to just open brackets and write expansion depending on how many of this new you will take. So this expansion K characterizes how many of new would you take when you take uh, uh, open the brackets. So K can be one, two, and so on up to N. One corresponds to the fact that you don't have any of these eaters. And then uh, what you will have, you will have times when you pick these eaters and po lattice points X where you pick them. So it's let's put X1, XK and times, times are ordered I1, I2, IK between zero and N. And then you have this product of this eaters which you pick up. And then in between, you have to take sum over all uh, over the all paths between these points. And that sum uh, uh, will give you 
uh, this summation over gamma will come to the fact that you just have to take summation over simple random walks. So this this uh, this is the kernel corresponding Gaussian kernel, or say heat kernel corresponding to simple random walks. Give you probability of simple random walks going in time between this time and that time from this point to that point. So this is kind of um, Gaussian kernel, simple random work kernel and product of them. So this is non-random object, uh, which is well, very well understood. So that's expression for partition function. And then when you take square of it and you take expectation, when you want to look at the, at the uh, say second moment of it, what you will see is that uh, uh, different terms will be independent because in order, there is, it will be cross terms when you take square, but all cross terms will have expectation zero because it should be exact matching. Eaters have expectation zero and they're independent from each other. So unless you have square of these terms, you will have zero contribution to this partition function to the square of the partition function expectation of the square. So expression will be one plus sum. And this is a similar sum, but you have squares of eta and these squares of eta have expectation e to the beta square minus one. So you will have e, this e to the beta square minus one and power k coming from this k terms. And then you have sum of the squares of q. And uh, of course, uh, we know that if dimension is large enough, then sum of the squares of this uh, transition probabilities, if the transition probability to come to point z at time i is finite. And if dimension is greater than the equal than three. So if dimension higher than two, this sum is finite, it's some constant depending on dimension. And uh, well, that's a simple explanation of this fact. It's a trivial fact. So of course, you can just say that it's less than maximum of the thing times sum of them, sum is equal to one, sum over z, and maximum behave like one over i in power d over two. So it's some number when d is greater than three. And then, of course, when you look back to the expression for the square of the partition function expectation of it, uh, which is you need for L2 convergence, you will see that it's less or equal than this expression, which will be convergent geometrically as geometrical progression is bit is small enough. So that this product is less than one, then it's geometrical progression, which is convergent. So this thing are well defined. And uh, well, yeah, just uh, one minute, if it's possible, just to, to recall you the time. Sorry, if I one minute, one minute, a couple of minutes. Oh, sorry. Uh, okay. I'm sorry about that. Uh, can you just accommodate me for five minutes, which I lost? Yeah, I, I can yield some of my time to, to yeah, pass okay. you. Thank <laughs> you. Uh, uh, and so, uh, so that's all very simple, but what, where the difficulty come in? So the difficult comment is the fact that uh, uh, the, the, there is a factorization formula and factorization formulas say that partition function coming from point X in time S to point Y in pi T, T and S of uh, T minus S is large. It actually can be written as a product. So there's a factorization formula. It can be written as something which the partition function corresponding to X and X and S infinite partition function going to the future times infinite partition function at this point yt going to the past. And then uh, uh, you also have this factor which is transition probability going from X, y, X to Y and this term. So this partition function can be written this way, this factorization times uh, one plus small term and this factorization formula valid is not only in the regime when x minus y are in diffusive distance compared to t minus s, square root of t minus s, but much farther away, even in sub ballistic region, when y minus x is just very close to t minus s, this formula is still valid. And this is the key property for the extension of the Kiefer result, which we have that using this key property, that there's a factorization which valid much farther than the diffusive regime, we can prove uh, the, the results uh, of the theorem. Now, I want to say one important observation is that uh, important ingredient in the proof is the following fact that we, I just explained to you why this, but this random variable Z exists. But we, for the proof, we also need to control 
the situation where this thing takes very small values. So we need to control the moments of the inverse of the partition function, the limiting partition function, uh, so that all moments are finite. And to do this, you have to have Gaussianity. It should be true. It's, it's just some random variable with certain distribution. We don't know this distribution. It's an interesting question. Uh, so I suspect that this uh, random variable uh, one over z would have all the moments, but will not have exponential moments. So I think that the decay, uh, uh, the probability diffusion will be uh, stretch exponential for this random variable, but it's a difficult question. And uh, there is no information about moments of these random variables if uh, probability diffusion of the disorder was not Gaussian. And uh, so I will briefly glance through other things. I would just explain because otherwise it would be not complete. Uh, what is a weak disorder and what is a strong disorder? So uh, uh, directed polymers, it's random walks enhanced with Gibson formula. It's a random walks and random potential. And I remind you that the polymer measure giving this Gibbs factor where partition function just normalize it. And so there are two regimes here. There is a regime of strong disorder where uh, the behavior of this bench of paths when you enhance it with uh, this Gibson factor becomes very non-diffuse. It's, so of course, normally it is diffusive if you, there is no Gibson factor, just simple random walk to Brownian motions. Uh, and uh, sometimes it can be very non-diffusive or it can be diffusive. So then point will have Gaussian distribution after normalization of square root of the length. And uh, so, uh, uh, so here I describe uh, the, the same thing in a, uh, in a lattice case, it's nothing special, just the same formula. So the theorem up to uh, which was proved by Kermanahu and then uh, in the more general case by Comet, Shiga, Yoshida said the following, then the dimension one and two, there is always strong disorder. So always the polymer uh, will be non-diffusive and I will explain in which sense. And in dimension greater than three, there is transition for small potentials, uh, size potential for small potential, there's a weak disorder, diffusive behavior, and for strong, uh, for large lambda, there is a strong disorder. Now, weak disorder means that in particular, that endpoint distribution converges to Gaussian distribution with non-random diffusion matrix. So what is the most interesting regime is a strong disorder. So strong disorder regime correspond, uh, has a uh, strong localization property. So it says the following, that there is a, exists alpha greater than zero. And this alpha is uniform in n. It doesn't change with n. So some number. It of course depends on the probability distribution of disorder, but otherwise it's dependent on n. Such that for omega uh, from a set of large probability, and probability adds to one as n goes to infinity, they exist a, a point on the lattice such that probability to end up at that point is greater than alpha. So it's of course very non diffusive because in diffusive regime, all probabilities are order one over square root of n. And here probabilities stay positive and uniformly bounded away from zero and then goes to infinity. So what it means that the pass, this bench of passes, uh, the polymer measure uh, is localized in certain places. And so the most interesting, of course, situation comes when, KP, uh, when D is equal to one, where people expect that KPZ phenomena uh, in general uh, holds. And what it means is that if uh, we take uh, denote by uh, Zn omega, it's a point of maximum probability of n point, then KPZ conjecture would say that this point where maximum probability of n points located is scaled like n to the two third, and after you divide by two thirds, it converges to some universal law, this point. And uh, also uh, that uh, there is another part of trace freedom distribution, which is less of interest for me at this point. Uh, then normalization then to the one third, but I'm less interested in this scalings, one third and two third are called KPZ scalings. And so what I want to say here is that the unique global solution, which we discussed, uh, has important meaning for this KPZ scalings. And uh, uh, so the task is not just to prove the existence of this unique global solution uh, in dimension one, say, uh, D one equal to one, but the task is to prove uh, such a result that this unique global solution has the following property that if you take, it defined up to additive constant. So you take value at some far away point L times Y 
So you subtract value at point zero, everything is point at time zero, but it doesn't matter because solution has distribution. And then you normalize on square root of L, maybe some constant, and this converges to standard winner process. So that's an open problem in most of the models for most of disorders. But if this is done, being basically saying that increments of this process five, this global solution five increments are in certain sense weakly dependent, then you get this KPZ scalings. And now I finish basically by saying what strong disorder, how the strong disorder look like. So in weak disorder, the polymer is just distributed more or less uh, like diffusion. And so scales and distances n to the one half. And in it's a weak disorder, and strong disorder, it's a bench which has which localized, it's not spreading much. So there is a kind of lock if you shift your point here where the point of maximum is located, there's a some probability distribution or the one distributed near this point. And the conjecturally, uh, there is no limit of this thing, but there is a limiting statistics of this limiting distributions near this point. And this limiting distribution do not require any normalization. They are localized. That's a regime of strong disorder. And uh, so uh, I just finished by saying that unique global solution basically means the following, that uh, you want to prove that uh, if you start from two different points uh, at, at giving time zero, but from two different points, then polymer measures are getting closer and closer to each other. So that of course you start from different points, but after a long time, the probability distribution of that point will be almost the same starting from this point or from that. And that is the key to proving the fact of existence of uh, unique global solution, which I discussed here. And this is an open problem in dimension two and dimension three uh, where uh, lambda is large. So any two and three dimensional case of strong disorder is open. And in the case of weak disorder, uh, you can say that what is going on that, of course, they're not localized, but these two points correspond, the end point has Gaussian distribution. And the fact that you shift to the one doesn't change much this distribution of the end point. And that's a, a kind of heuristic explanation why you have unique global solution in this situation. And this, of course, there is a harder problem in the uh, inviscid case when mu is equal to zero, when instead of polymer measures, you have to have, uh, uh, you have to have uh, minimizers converging from two different points converging to each other. That's a harder problem by not uh, touching it. What it makes it harder is that in a viscous case, there is additional mechanism which make polymer measures closer to each other. If they have certain overlap at certain time, then there is a mechanism of getting them closer and closer, the Markov mechanism. And this Markov mechanism is absent when nu is equal to zero in this case. And that's why it's harder problem. So I would say that the problem, I believe that the problem of existence of global solution, unique global solution in uh, all the cases with positive viscosity in the quadratic case of quadratic Hamiltonian is a realistic problem. And I believe it can be done. And I should mention the recent papers of uh, uh, Alex Dunlap, uh, Cole Graham and Lerner Rizek, who didn't prove existence of unique global solution, but they proved convergence to statistical e equilibrium. And they used completely different methods, PDE methods to prove convergence to statistical equilibrium. This is a related problem. And uh, we hope that maybe some combination of methods which we are using and the methods which are used uh, by uh, Leonia, Alex, and Cole uh, will be helpful to, to get results in more general situation. Thank you very much and sorry for taking longer time. Thank you. Thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I'm sorry. So that, that was just for uh, time. Uh, I thought that's a very nice and amazing talk. Uh, and I just invited you just because we are on a tight schedule. You know, I um, understand, of course, and I'm sorry for the delay. No, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. Uh, it's now I invite uh, Alexander Dallap to to change uh, to, to I invite you to unshare the screen, Constantine. Yes. Un second. Unshare the screen. There is a stop. There is a, a red button. No, there is a. Okay. Now I invite the commentator of this talk to um, change. Alex. Huh? Please. Okay, let me. 
I invite Alex Dunlap to, okay? Right. okay. So Sorry. Alex, I probably, you, you, I just give you, if you, if you, if you can, I'm five giving. to 10 minutes because you yeah, gave okay. some time to complete that if you can, so, let, so you will have less time if you, I think yeah, you will. Okay, yeah. please. Yeah. Uh, great. Yes. Yeah, so, so um, I guess I'll, I'll just make a couple couple comments or discussion um, points on the very nice talk we just heard. Um, so, I, I guess the the um, the first kind of thing I wanted to kind of mention is that um, I guess at the very end of his talk, Constantine mentioned this issue of of, sort of statistically stationary solutions versus these um, global solutions, um, and so. If we if we look at the uh, the Hamilton Jacobi equation that that was sort of the, the main focus of the talk, um, you know, there's a sort of big conjecture that that um, this should have these global solutions in in um, in all in all dimensions and and with all um, with all noise strength. Um, but um, as 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 Constantine mentioned, that these solutions are are not um, expected to be to be space time stationary, um, except in the um, in the in the um, weak disorder regime, um, and so what is going to be what is going to be um, space time stationary statistically is is going to be the gradient um, of these of this Hamilton Jacobi equation or this this function that, that um, sometimes we call U, uh, which, which satisfies this um, stochastic conservation law. So this is the this would be like the Burgers equation um, that, that Constantine talked about, um, and and this this one the global solutions here these are actually expected to be space time stationary. Um, regardless of the dimension and, and regardless of beta. Um, and so there's this kind of trade-off um, that, that um, you know, many people in this, this area have, have been kind of working with that, um, you know, this Kohlhoff transform that, that, um, that Constantine mentioned, um, you know, it, it actually linearizes the problem. So it, so it turns this, um, it turns this, these nonlinear equations, this nonlinear Hamilton Jacobi equation, that, um, the KVC equation into this stochastic heat equation, which is a linear equation, um, which is which is much easier to to work with in, in a certain sense. Um, but but on the other hand, um, so it's an, it's an easier equation to work with because it's it has this linearity property. But um, but phenomenologically, it, it's actually much worse um, because unlike the the, the nonlinear conservation law that that um, that was mentioned. Um, it, it actually doesn't have stationary solutions, um, except in this sort of limited regime of, of um, the weakest order regime. Um, and then also, as, as Constantine was talking about, if, you, if you're interested in sort of reasonable initial data for the, for the Hamilton Jacobi equation, um, this, this uh, stochastic heat equation is, is going to have sort of enormous, uh, enormous tails or you know, grows sort of exponentially or almost exponentially quickly at infinity if you want to do sort of reasonable sublinear um, initial growth for the the Hamilton Jacobi equation. Um, and so there's sort of, you know, uh, you know, a variety of kind of approaches to, to kind of deal with this trade off sort of where you want to pay the difficulty in terms of, um, you know, how difficult the, the SPDE is to study versus how, how good the results you're going to get are. Um, and so, so some of the results that, that Constantine was talking about in, you know, this one dimensional setting. Um, you know, they work with the, with the directed polymers, um, which sort of corresponds to working with the, uh, you know, linear stochastic heat equation where we have this nice polymer interpretation. Um, and then, but then they don't actually want to, they don't actually care about the, uh, about the solution to the stochastic heat equation. What they care about is the, is the sort of logarithmic, logarithmic derivative of it. Um, and so then that, that's sort of where you're, where, where they're paying the difficulty is, um, you know, the stochastic heat equation is not going to have nice solutions, but, but this is kind of a Harnack inequality or, um, or you know, some kind of log the logarithmic derivative is behaved sort of more nicely than a solution and they exploit the, the space time stationarity there. Um, and then you know some of some of uh, some of our work with with um, with Cole Graham and, and Lenny Rizik recently is sort of a, the concept he mentioned at the end is is sort of a different approach where we work directly with the stochastic conservation law. Um, and so the there's sort of more sort of PDE ingredients because the equation is not linear anymore. Um, but, but we don't have to deal with the log the log um, derivative. Um, so, so that's you know there's kind of different because these three equations are sort of so closely related to each other. There's sort of different different ways you can play the game in terms of um, you know what what you want to be hard and what, what you want to be difficult. Um, 
And um, I guess I, I just, um, this factorization formula that, that Constantine mentioned, I, I guess I just wanted to draw a little picture here, at least in the diffusive case that's sort of um, well understood, you know, before the, the before the most um, you know, recent advance that, that he was talking about. But, um, but uh, to me, this factorization formula um, that, that sort of says if, if we're interested in the sort of polymer measure between um, two space time points, that it, it can be sort of written as this, uh, you know, sort of from one point off to infinity, and then, you know, from the other point down to minus infinity, and then it's just sort of a heat kernel in between. Um, you know, to me, the, the picture here is that this is, this is kind of analogous to, um, you, know, you know, at least in the sort of diffusive picture, that, that if we're interested in the polymer sort of between time t and time s, um, in this weak, weak to sort of regime, we can actually sort of turn off, turn off the noise in a big intermediate um, regime. So if, if this is sort of a long time here, but sort of small compared to the, the overall time, um, you know, it's actually only the noise on, on some kind of layer around the, the uh, final and, um, and initial times that's actually contributing and the noise in the, in the middle um, doesn't, doesn't actually really contribute. Um, and, and so that's where this sort of heat kernel um, here sort of comes in. Um, so that's just kind of another picture, I guess, to, to kind of, uh, to represent this, you know, this kind of um, phenomenology. Um, but again, this is only true in the, in the, uh, the weak disorder regime. Um, and, and so, you know, in, in, in general, the, in the, not, in the strong disorder regime, this, um, the partition function will actually be sort of blowing up um, for a long time, you know, over long times. And it's only sort of the ratio of the partition function that sort of remain control um, that, that's um, what's gonna happen. Um, and just sort of one kind of, you know, use of this technique that sort of has, has been sort of um, described, you know, it's kind of another sort of application of, of this, um, you know, weak disorder kind of thing that, that, um, that happens is that if you, if you start, if you work on diffusive scaling with some sort of different initial condition, um, then um, the, the factorization formula means that it's, it's only sort of the noise and sort of a very small layer um, around the final condition that's actually contributing to the solution. Um, and so if you start with some kind of um, different initial condition um, that's sort of slowly varying and then you look on a long time scale, um, you can, the, the initial condition really just feels a, a deterministic heat equation. Um, and then you kind of, so you, you get something that's evolving with just a deterministic heat equation from the initial condition. Um, and then you multiply that by the, by the global solution um, at the end to, to kind of find your, your final solution. But the, so it's the, the Microscopic behavior is sort of governed by a small layer around the, the final time, and then the, the macroscopic behavior is actually not really feeling the noise. So you get this sort of um, decomposition here. Um, so, anyways, um, I think I, I wrote down a couple of future directions because um, asked you, but I think Constantine um, mentioned many future directions. Um, so I think I'll, I'll stop there. And, uh, yeah, I guess. I don't know if I'm supposed to moderate the questions. If Carlos, okay. So if you want to comment or this, which I mean, it's uh, we have one or two minutes for question. Or if you want to, or if you want to, as you like. But by the way, we thank you, Alex, for your nice uh, discussion. Yeah, I'll stop here and. Um, okay.